Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more. And we have turned the page on the calendar. It is now May 1st, 2016, and I'm really, really, really excited to be talking to Ken Stringfellow and John Auer of The Posies. Thank you guys so much for coming on Media Monarchy. Oh, we're having a great time. Loving it. Appreciate it. So you guys just started the U.S. tour. Was the second show in L.A. last night? We, we did uh, four shows. Oh. In three days in L.A. All sold out. Nice. Nice. And now a uh, six-hour drive to Phoenix. Are you listening to Glenn Campbell along the way? Uh, we're listening to some other stuff, but uh, <laughs> that's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we to put that on, actually. your advice on that one. <laughs> Man, I... I I honestly, I saw you guys at my very first concert. I was a 15 year old and I talked my mom into, hey, let's go to D.C. and we can visit Aunt Norma and I can go to this big D.C. concert featuring NXS. And that was my main draw. And you guys were there and Ned's Atomic Dustbin and X and Iggy Pop and Matthew Sweet. And that was a hugely influential show to me. And I think about it to this day. And and I love that you guys were there then and you are still doing it now. That WHF Festival? That's it. Yeah. Wow. A blast. 23 years ago. That's yeah. it. So, and even in my memory, I think you guys probably closed with Burn and Shine, and I remember you just kind of leaning your guitar up against the, the the stack and just wicked feedback until the guitar tech came out and turned it off. Yes, sounds like something we do. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of how we roll. Yeah. <laughs> so, are you guys playing as a trio right now? Yes, we are. Um, yes, there's a lot of a lot is different. A lot has changed. Um, in the last couple of years for us, considering that, you know, we've gone a long time without making a record or touring really in the States. Um, you know, you can imagine things might change when you're, when no one's looking. Uh, but people, what, well, you know, we had some musical ideas to switch it up a little bit, uh, already going into making this record since it had been a long time. We felt we should, you know, really present something new. And then at the same time, you know, like our dear friend and drummer, Darius Minwala, uh, our drummer for the last 15 years, passed away uh, unexpectedly last year. And well, there's no way to look back at that point. Um, and so we've already been working with Frankie, who's playing drums with us now, in the studio. Um, and there's no... You know, at that point, there's no question that he sort of had to be the guy to come on tour with us. Um, why no bass player? Um, because the music is different. The music is, most of the record is synth bass. And we just kind of, you know, we just turn a page, you know. That's just how it is. Uh, musically, personnel-wise, we just re- we just hit refresh on the screen and here we are. Nice. So that's actually maybe to give people a little bit of background. You you guys haven't put out a record since 2010, I believe, and you've got the brand new, the brand new record Solid States coming out, and you just wrapped up the European tour. And just from some quick YouTubing and looking around, you guys, it, it seems like you've got a hugely engaged and excited fan base out there. There are a ton of new YouTube clips from the tour. Yeah, I mean, also I have to say that you know going out there with the new drummer playing new songs on an album that wasn't released yet because we would hope we didn't want to have it we wanted to make it a little bit opposite of how it usually is where everything's everywhere the album was only available at the shows etc um, you had to come to the shows to buy it and the, so we're playing all new songs new lineup new technology we're you know using a laptop and like you know playing along with some tracks from a laptop uh, all of this stuff was new big risk to take and it totally paid off people loved it and I have to say that you know Frankie just blew people away, you know, like, you know, like that, you can imagine that, like, okay, there's somebody else in the band who got used to, like, Darius or whatever, and, you know, there was just, he's just so good, nobody, nobody could possibly question it. Yeah, he was, he was instantly accepted, you know, that's, that's the only way to really put it. I mean, there was no, like, like, downtime as far as acceptance, it just kind of happened instantly. I mean, people were chanting his name, all sorts of stuff. Oh, nice. Well, and I've I've heard you guys say before in interviews that it's about sort of 
continuing to find things that excite you and that people sort of people love new bands. So so case in point, I, I went to go see a show just last night, a band from L.A. called Bleached. I don't know if you've heard of them. No. Nope. So, sold out sold out show you know super young band and you kind of go to show sometimes you're like this band isn't that big is it just sort of the excitement of the new that gets people out and I know that that's in some ways the battle of when you're not the exactly new thing you have to find ways like you said to sort of hit the refresh button well we're lucky though I mean we, you know we were lucky to be around when you know there were like lots of bands getting signed to you know large record deals with major labels and I mean, we benefited greatly from those times I mean it sent us to to Europe for the first time when we did a, we did a tour uh, on Frosty on the Beater where you know we spent two months in Europe opening for Teenage Fan Club and like you know Juliana Hatfield 3 was on the bill sometimes Super Chunk mm-hmm. and we're still benefiting from that exposure and those times that we spent there you know we we, we might not have the, the largest audience in the world but we do have a you know, it's enough to keep going, and and they're really they're really loyal. You know, I'm dedicated. We kind of came from a slightly older school time. You know, the, the, before like the information, the speed of information like went exponential, and where people can only concentrate on what to do. We come from a time a little bit before that. So we're kind of grandfathered in in many ways. Uh, you know, to the attention span of, of people who have attention spans. And, and we're just trying, you know, for us, being from that era, I mean, I guess our challenge is to try to figure out how to kind of work within what's happening now, too, which is part of what we're trying to do on this record as well with the new platform we're working with, uh, you know, My Music Empire, et cetera, you know. Um, I mean, it really is like hitting the refresh, you know, button in all ways. Well, and, I, and, and not to compare you too much, but I, I, I see the comparisons. And, and, and again, this is... I, you know, I, I call the site Media Monarchy because it is a lot of my life. I've been a media-addled kid from the very beginning. A lot of stuff I saw growing up as a, as a kid in West Virginia was because I saw it on 120 Minutes. And I was able to go to the mall that weekend with my paper route and lawn mowing money and, and buy tapes. But you guys, you were talking about, you know, being signed up at the time. You're on DGC at the same time as one of my favorite bands, Sloan. And they actually just came through town this sure. last this last week, and they I think are in a similar position that you guys are that you are sort of grandfathered in because you were together since I mean in Sloan's case early '90s, in your guys's case I mean even the the late '80s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, I mean, I think to some degree too, like the longevity speaks for itself. I mean, we must be doing something right with our approach to either either the, either musically or in terms of like our engagement or whatever to, to keep people interested because we're still here and I know there are, you know there are bands that, that like some of the bigger bands when we started out like in 1988 I mean like Cat Butt was a pretty popular band in Seattle they were signed to stuff up or Blood Circus and you know I mean they're fine bands or whatever but you know, I, 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 those, they're not sustainable. You know, they're like Blood Circus is not touring around because what would they do? I mean, like, you know, like they would play like their 1988 pop release and people probably heard it and I'm not sure that would generate that much interest. Sure, and at the same time, we haven't gone the route yet, yet. <laughs> probably not. Uh, we haven't like done the whole casino or trying to do like the 90s, you know, cruises. You know, we haven't we decided mm. to not go that route. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and do things like, you know, still try to challenge ourselves a little bit, like do different things on our records and maybe do some things that older fans might not like initially, but I think if they give it a chance, they'll find out that it's still us and that they will like it. So and is it, it keeps it fresh for us. I mean, I mean, the older you get, I mean, what else are you going to do? You have to do something to keep life interesting. You can't keep doing the same thing. I mean, that's like kind of like dying or something. Uh-huh. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, is it is it possible that, and even probable, that not having kind of big, massive commercial success has actually kept you together longer? I think it, it's possible, yes, because, um, number one, like, our, if our expectations haven't gotten raised to where we expect to have a tour bus, or we expect certain things to happen, or we expect to have a crew of a certain size, you know, we... We, we are very lean and compact. We, just, we are just the three of us on the road right now, for example, and we have no crew or whatever. 
And, you know, some people, like, if they get used to not having to lift their gear, it's kind of hard to go backwards. Um, I don't see it as going backwards. I just see it as being adaptable. Um, carpool lane, maybe. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to change anything. Oh. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think... Um, you know, something, something else on that, too. I mean, you know, maybe this is a good problem to have, but, you know, we have friends that are in bands that had, like, that one song that was, like, really popular for them that, mm-hmm. you know, when people, a, a large portion of their audience comes to the show, they want to hear that song, and, and, you know, half the audience will leave after they play it. Like, I mean, uh, a good friend of ours, Sean Nelson, this band, Harvey Danger. I Hell, mean, yeah. Great band, and they make incredible records, and they're super intelligent and whatever, but a, a lot of... Uh, you know, they they feel kind of, const- they have especially felt const- constricted and confined by having this one song that everybody wants to hear from them. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, our fans, most of them come to hear, like, our body of work, which is actually really nice in the long run. I mean, I, you know, I mean, sure, maybe it would be great to have that one song that really gets getting played everywhere and for, you know, other reasons. But I think in the long run, Maybe we actually would prefer that. We, we kind of sneak it in, you know. I mean, like we have a song like "Coming Right Along," which was never a single, but it's you know been in a movie soundtrack, was just in like the following, and you know has generated significant mm-hmm. revenue. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, and that, but that happens in a very low key way, like you would never guess it. Oh, and and uh, what's uh, the the the, the, uh, the color and the? What's oh yeah, kind of maybe in city and color just did a cover of it. Yeah, it's it's just like no. it kind of keeps on going. It's got it's got some serious legs, you know, in kind of a you know not so obvious way. Well, and it's funny. I always think of you know bands like maybe bands like Blur, who in some ways they sort of have that like they sort of have that horror song like for them. It's the woohoo song number one. It's like yep, we sell it out. It's on commercials. It's on movies. No one really even knows it's us, but it probably generates a ton and ton a ton of money. A shit ton. Oh, you shit Sorry, I <laughs> no, uh, you're, you you're, you're, a, a, bleep, a bleep ton, in fact. It is a bleep ton. Actually, I saw Sean Nelson do a solo thing here in Portland. He was playing with John Roderick of the Long Winters. And I, man, I got to say, Harvey Danger's sophomore record, King James Ber- Version, is, I think, just such an unheralded power pop classic. Very good record. I sing on that record. Oh, no kidding? Yeah. Nice. I, I haven't had the liner notes and the stuff for it. I, I just kind of know it from, from back in the college radio days. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you this. From listening to the record, and we'll, and we'll talk specifically about the record and some of the songs, some of the things I want to ask you about. But I think just sort of, it's a very different time now than when we were in the 90s and, and even, in the, you know, even in the early 2000s. In listening to some of the lyrics and in looking at what you're doing and you're doing your own kind of tour and we can t- and again we'll talk about the pop up tour and secret shows and things. <laughs> Have you been, for lack of a better word, radicalized just by seeing everything that's kind of going on in the world and is that coming out in the music a little more in the lyrics? Uh, are you talking about politically right now? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, social. Just everything that kind of see and over the last ten, fifteen years, realize that we're being, you know, run by psychopaths and things don't seem to be yeah. changing. <laughs> what, what else is new, though, right? right? There, there's a, there's a, uh, a reasonableist point of view, I think, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that does run, there is a sub-theme in the record of just, you know, like, you're one person and, you know, in theory, like, uh, as a citizen, especially of this country, like, you should have Quite a bit. Your, the fact your your embodiment as a citizen should have uh, quite a bit of force to it, like influence, and also that the limits of like what can encroach upon your freedom of movement should be uh, rather broad. You know, like like should be like kept away from you. Um, and I feel, you know, I personally feel like that is slowly chipping away. And, and you know, there's several aspects to it in that. You know, the most powerful institutions, you know, government is coming in, you know, second to Google. You know, Mm -hmm. private institutions have an immense amount of power, um, and it's sort of uncheckable. I mean, these are like basically monopolies. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely this kind of thing. We love the convenience, uh, you know, as Jello Biafra said, give me convenience or give me death. Um, but it's definitely, you know, 
we probably don't realize how encircled we are um, and how how easily like the basics could be taken away if you know we don't behave and that's kind of a frightening thought for sure what can you do yeah and, and in the internet age it's like I mean now more than ever I mean you know people you know people you, you can your information can be followed I mean people can they can see what you're doing or just cut off I mean, like you could be isolated really quick mm-hmm. that's something that hasn't happened yet but it, but it could happen you know you could have your you could someone could just remotely disconnect you from communication Mm-hmm. Maybe pretty screwed. And it's also relatively new that the long term ramifications of it haven't really shown themselves yet too. I mean it's like I mean not, you know, who knows what the future holds. Uh we're, I guess we're gonna find out. Well and yeah, I you know, thing. I think it, it's it, I've been making alternative news for a while now and things that we sort of used to talk about with hushed tones are now just out and about and it's all very sort of publicly known and now you guys are quoting Jello Biafra so I I know you've always been radicalized. We're talking to Ken Stringfellow and John Auer of the Posies. I'm really glad they're taking some time to talk to Media Monarchy while they are literally on the road going from LA to Phoenix on their new US tour. The record Solid States is available on the shows and you guys just sold out the Portland date. Yes, we did. So how's uh, it going? How's it so going? And, and actually, you go. can you can you describe exactly how you guys are doing this tour? Is a sort of pop up tour or sort of secret shows? It's it's both of those things. So you know, we what we what the parameters of the tour are in general, with a couple of exceptions, are that we're gonna we're not gonna play in any clubs. Uh, we're gonna play in you know. Whatever it could be, a it could be a house or it could be grain silo. Yeah, it could be a crop circle. Um, you know, a muffin top shop. Um, you know, we just play in different kinds of spaces um, and unlikely spaces. Unlikely spaces. It is the <laughs> unlikely places tour. Um, and also, you know, that to find out where the show is, you have to buy a ticket. Um, to get the album, you have to buy a ticket and buy it there. Um, we're not. The album is not out, it's not on the streaming, et cetera. It won't be until the tour is over. Um, so you have to come to the show. But now the shows are selling out, so there's only a few that have tickets left anyway. But we, uh, it worked like a charm, in other words. Yeah, and the people that have come in, the reactions we've got, I mean, they actually really enjoy it because it's, it's, it's fun. It's like something different. They feel, you know, the reactions have been, like, awesome to it. Well, and it's expensive, so they're kind of like, we better like this. Exactly. They're, <laughs> yeah, paying, they're, they're paying for it, you know. <laughs> well, and again, I think that speaks to it. sort of finding things that still excite you and and keeping keeping it sort of exactly. exciting. So you you mentioned uh, unlikely places. That was the the second song I heard from the record, and I want to talk about Squirrel versus Snake in just a second. But even the yeah. beginning of the album kind of begins with what struck me as almost that sort of mission statement. The song comes charging out of the gate. It's called We Are Power. And you even mention in there sort of resist to the final hour, which, again, I think me kind of keying in on those sort of, you know, radicalized statements, I guess. Yes, I mean, we are, we are, it's not over yet. I mean, like, I mean, I'm not like advocating like you know going and burning stuff mm-hmm. down or anything i'm just like i mean i'm not that radical i you know i am i i'm just like what i am is for me personally you know i'm like a kind of like a like a basically i believe in like you know mom and pop kind of kind of operations and i think that we that's a wonderful way like what we're doing is a mom and pop business um and you know with, i will say that the u.s right now for what we're doing it's very you know you can use there's still like you can if you want to do if you want a business you have a lot of freedom um, more so than like in, in France where it's a lot more regulatory and, and etc um, but the thing is like it could all be just yanked out of your hands any second um, but we still have abilities and powers to, to you know talk to each other and decide where we want to go it's just that so many things right now are not subject to like enough oversight or enough participation, uh, and it, and that's that's disturbing. We, we yes, you find out about things on the internet and you you, you sign an internet petition, whatever the hell that does, um, you know, like things like net neutrality, all this kind of stuff. But boy, oh boy, I mean, 
there are lots of decisions being made that suddenly are, you know, that are just imposed, I, you know, in, in different areas around the world, whether that's, you know, the use of GMOs in Europe, which, you know, like when I moved to France, like GMOs were completely banned. Uh, Monsanto lobbied to be sold, and lo and behold, they're banned in Oh, you're breaking up, Captain. The powers that be, which are generally generally corporate, uh, the, those powers, I mean, I'm making money, I think it's great, but it's that when it starts that's, um, but they're banking on the fact that as long as people are happy with playing fucking Candy Crush or whatever, that they're not going to make a fuss. So, um, that's a bummer because I think they're off the right. Well, and you're, you're breaking up there a little bit and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth with all my radicalized comments, but I think it's all about sort of removing consent in a lot of ways. It's sort of not giving the consent to, to those powers that shouldn't be. Just participate to pay attention. But, but also people don't really pay yeah, consent. People don't pay attention enough. I mean, they'd rather, you know, they're more concerned about their Wi-Fi reception and their entertainment and, you know, a lot of people don't give a don't give a hoot about those kind of things. So the song Squirrel vs. Snake, I think to me, kind of feels like the centerpiece, at least in spirit to the new album, where it kind of talks about, you know, a God that should be relied on, a government that says I should be spied on. And you even sort of mentioned the Holy Halftime Show. And it sort of, again, to me, kind of feels like the centerpiece of, of the spirit of the album. Of, 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 the album is kind of, it has two major themes. So it, that would, could be the centerpiece of one of them. Uh, you know, this kind of you know, are we totally lost? Are we totally overwhelmed? Is the, is the battle actually over, but we're being, like, kind of led to believe that we have room to maneuver, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a sub-theme for about half the album or, or, or a significant portion of the album, and that, 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 that we are being surrounded, etc., and that Squirrel vs. Snake is kind of just like, there's, we have, do we even have any choices left, for example, in the, in the, in the political arena that matter, and we'll, would we even be allowed to make those choices uh, if, if they were if they were available? Would, you know, is it just a, is it just a, a freaking sham? Um, I mean, I mean, there's a whole another point of and a whole another component of the album that is nothing to do with you know daily life on Earth. You know, more to do with you know. <laughs> loss and, and, and the great beyond and like basically coping with the, the loss of our, our, our drummer Darius for example who died in the middle of making this album that's a huge huge component of the album which has its own centerpiece too um, you know it's a, it's a, it's a bifocal album in that sense you're right. You're right. And I've actually, I've got kind of track by track notes and it, you know, it gets to the point, you know, by the third track, it sort of slows it down and it does feel personal and not necessarily political. And the song Titanic is this sort of slow burner that blows up and kind of the big vocal explosion. The record is really good. And I'm really excited that the response has been so good for you guys. So we've been talking to John and Ken from the Posies. They are literally on the road on their U.S. tour for their new record, Solid States. Just in the last couple of minutes here with you, like I said, I was kind of trolling around on YouTube looking at stuff. You guys are really well represented with some of the stuff that's on YouTube. Your Dear 23 release party performance is on YouTube from September 1990. Where you I've seen it. Yeah. Thanks, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that feel good? Does it feel weird? I mean, because there, there's a lot of ways. The things you sort of can't, you can't take it back. With it. Yeah, it's all good in the end. I mean, it's not. I mean, you can't take it back. But it, it, it's nice that there's uh, that there's a couple that. Yeah, sure, you might get a little bit embarrassed, kind of in the like it's in your high school yearbook kind of <laughs> picture kind of way, you know. But uh, in the end, it's all fine. Actually, check out the picture of uh, the sorry, the video of us doing pictures of Louie by the Who at a house party in 1988. Yeah, it's really <laughs> funny. Um, you know, it's funny we, we get a TV thing that like it's funny. We did a TV thing at 7 in the morning in San Francisco on the Amazing Disgrace Tour. And for some reason, that's never surfaced. Yeah. I'm really curious what that <laughs> looked like. Did we play on Ontario? Is that what we did? I, I think we did, yeah. 
And there's this really kind of frightening but kind of cool thing called JBTV that we did oh, yeah. at this house where Ken and I basically riffed for an hour with this guy. And this guy, I don't know what this guy was on or what he wasn't on. Uh, but that's worth hunting down if, if you want to do something that could be considered yeah. painful, but I kind of dig it. It's, and what's amazing is this guy is still going. I just found out that this guy, yeah. we, who we did a like, public access show with in 1990, yeah. was clearly older than us at that time. He's still doing JBTV. <laughs> it's on everybody, though. I mean, the Smashing Pumpkins, it's kind of an institution out there, I guess, you know? Kind of like the Joe Franklin show, but with a much stranger host. Well, and there you go. I think that still kind of speaks back to you. You keep at it. You keep at it with your heart and keep moving forward. And before you know it, you're you're legend. So let me ask you one one last question. I always like to ask people, what records, what new music are you digging right now? What's what's playing in the car or on the bus? Uh, well, we just, you know, people pass us stuff. But I can say that we're going to look forward to listening to later today, Those Pretty Wrongs which is uh, the new band with uh, Jody Stevens from Big Star and mm. Luther Russell, who is in a band called The Freewheelers that were signed to get them by the time we were. And Luther was my host uh, in Los Angeles. So we have also have the record on cassette, but there's uh, no cassette player in the uh, vehicle here. So we'll settle for the CD. Nice. Man, you guys, I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm, 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 trigger, Dark. What's that? It's a co-release between Burger Records, the you know hipster label with that sets. only used until recently in LA, with Ardent Music, you know, like the record that released the label of Big Star. It's total like, wow, everything is melted into one. I gotta go back. There it is. So, there it is. Well, you guys, be safe on the road. I look forward to when you guys roll around here to Portland, actually at the very end of the tour. So you've got a very busy month of May as you go all around the United States, I think, with a renewed sense of kind of purpose and mission and vigor. Ken Stringfellow, John Auer of the Posies, thank you so much for coming on Media Monarchy. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Be safe. Ciao. Ciao. Later. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.